with the emergence of NATO in Western Europe in specific response to the communist takeover in Czechoslovakia in 1948 and the Berlin blockade, uh, directives were issued to establish Europe-wide stay-behind organizations along the lines which existed in the final years of World War II in Western Europe. There was a, an amendment to the NATO protocol and that amendment was absolutely necessary. You didn't get in the door unless you sign. And what was in that amendment was the agreement of the government not to prosecute right-wing activists, right-wing activities, anti-communist activists in their own countries. It's uh, not unlikely that some right-wing groups were recruited and uh, made, a, made to be stay-behinds because uh, they w would indeed have tipped us off if, if a war were going to begin. Uh, they, so using right-wingers, uh, if you use them uh, not politically but for intelligence purposes, is okay. In 1948, I was uh, a special agent with CIC, that's our counterintelligence corps, in occupied Germany. I was stationed in Augsburg, and as such, since I spoke fluent German, I was assigned to handle a network of German informants. Among them was Klaus Barbie, and Klaus Barbie was uh, later on, I discovered that he was wanted for murder by the French, and that uh, I reported this to my uh, superiors and they told me to keep nice and quiet. He's still valuable. When he's no longer valuable, we'll turn him over to the French. I thought that I was going to get a promotion when I told him about Barbie, and they told me to keep quiet. Colonel Gunther Bernau was an agent, an informant, working for the military intelligence in Stuttgart. We had provided him a a home, a safe house in Ludwigsburg, and uh, there I met him three times a week, and he brought us information about uh, communists and whatever we wanted to hear, he told us. He was certainly a very strong Nazi. Uh, I sat in his office one day and opened his uh, album of pictures from the war, and in the middle of the album it showed a nice picture of Adolf Hitler several other high-ranking SS officers who came to visit him in his safe house that we had provided. And he told me that uh, if for any reason he needs help, by one telephone call he could contact 200 former SS leaders from Hamburg to Munich. I remember him taking me to one particular spot which we un uncovered and uh, dug it out and there were uh, rifles, small arms, grenades, all nicely wrapped in cosmoline. And he said, we have thousands of these all over the country. And that sort of made me a little suspicious, and I reported this, and they said, well, we, we know this. They're all working for us in case the communists come across the uh, Iron Curtain. A former general, SS general, Paul Hauser, was a frequent visitor at uh, Bernau's house, and uh, uh, they worked together hand in glove about certain programs which we didn't know anything about, and I wasn't even asked to find out more about it. Somebody above me must have been running this network already at that time. The man in Adenauer's office, who also had, I guess, his uh, fullest confidence, who oversaw Gladio in its earliest stages, was a fellow named... Dr. Glopke, who was an ex-Nazi, who Adenauer had brought into the government the way he brought a lot of ex-Nazis into the government, because I guess his position was that these were the only people who really had any administrative experience, and uh, so they were, uh, I guess, denazified, if you want to call it that. They were cleaned up a little bit like uh, today, Nazi tomorrow, Democrat, like changing undershirts. What we were doing is either with the government, 
uh, secretly or independently on our own looking for people who might perform this function in some country where you didn't have that connection with the government or whatever, or maybe you did as a supplement. But maybe one or two extra people that uh, would have this training that would stay there during a Soviet occupation and be the base that you could then talk about recruiting other people to join. There was documentary material when Colby was station chief in Stockholm that he had been in touch with former Swedish volunteers in the Nordic legions of the SS, the Waffen SS, and people who later came to be known, I guess, as Sveaborg, that he was recruiting these uh, people. The first scandal connected to the Stay Behind groups broke in 1952 with the discovery of assassination teams linked to the Bundesdeutsche Jungen. In all those countries, some elements of the social democratic or socialist parties aligned themselves with the communists into so-called national unity parties or socialist unity parties. The presumption was that should the Soviet army make a move toward the West, uh, they would try to build some kind of a German puppet government in the German territory which they would occupy. The Bund Deutsche Jugend was a right-wing political organization loosely affiliated with one of the political parties in the state of Hesse in Germany and it was deemed that these people have the motivation and the willingness to serve as part of the underground should the Soviet army indeed overrun all or part of West Germany. Now as part of these preparations against that day uh, somebody's enthusiasm ran away with his judgment and they drew up a list of German politicians including many prominent social democrats who they thought might be the kind of people that the Soviet army would look for in trying to organize a puppet government when the story broke, there was a considerable flap, and it was deemed desirable that General Truscott should personally explain to the people involved what had happened. And we explained the situation, first to Sansor Konrad Adenauer of Germany, then we explained it to General Matthew Ridgeway, who was then the commander-in-chief of NATO, and finally, and most importantly, we explained it to Prime Minister George Sin of Hesse, who himself was on that list. And Truscott explained to the Hessian Prime Minister that this was an unauthorized activity, to be sure only a paper exercise, but of which he was unaware, and it certainly shouldn't be interpreted as in any way casting aspersions on our confidence in Prime Minister Sin. From the beginning, Gladio was really divided into two spheres of influence, British and American, because the, the original agreement between Sir Stuart Menzies and uh, the uh, XOSS people, Wisner and those, had foreseen that the British would retain their sphere of influence in the countries that were traditionally British, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, Portugal, Spain, and the United States had very little to do with those. We'd see, or rather I would see, documents having to do with that, but if anything needed to be done, I would have to contact uh, somebody who had that responsibility in DI-6. Après la guerre, euh, le ministre, le chef de l'intelligence de service, Menzies, M. Menzies a pris contact avec euh, le ministre des Affaires étrangères de Belgique, M. Spack, très connu, M. Paul-Henri Spack, et euh, ils se sont entendus sur euh, le principe 
de créer un réseau stébien et de belges euh, en période de paix afin justement de ne pas connaître tous les inconvénients et tous les dangers qui avaient été liés à la constitution de stébienne pendant la guerre.